Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. God, come by your spirit and move in us, Lord. And God, I just thank you for what you're going to do in this service. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is time for the message this morning, and I've titled it, Standing Out. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I started into the book of Matthew. We're going we're gonna to go in and out of the book of Matthew in, for the coming months. Um, it's not going to be a, a, a linear walkthrough of the book of Matthew, why is the book of Matthew so important? Starting with the, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the most challenging sermon you will ever hear in your life. Start at uh, chapter 5 in Matthew. Read it this week. Read, read through the, the, the two or three chapters that are there, and you will be challenged. If you can read the Sermon on the Mount, and I mean read it, I mean taking it in. If you can read it and apply it to yourself and say, um, I think it's talking to me, your life will be different. It, there's no possible way you, you can go through the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and not be challenged. This is Jesus' own words about life here until you, you make it to heaven. And, and uh, we're going to go through that. But it's more, there's more to it than just the Sermon on the Mount. There's so many other great things that Jesus talks about. 
So we're going to be going in and out of that because I think it's going to really challenge your life. Does anybody here want to be challenged? All right, that's, that's almost half. I, that's, I'll take it. That's a good start. Um, we need to be challenged. And unfortunately, friends, I think that as the days grow darker, um, we tend to do a couple of things. We either turtle and we hide or we deny what's going on and just, oh, it doesn't really, it's not that big a deal. Or we get so flustered by it that we're no good either. And and I've talked about this a lot, extremes. Um, Extremes aren't good in most cases. Extremists on any side of any argument tend to distort the reality that's going on. And so if things are, 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 are difficult, if you go into full panic mode and you start to lash out, it doesn't help anybody. It just it creates more tension. It, in, the, in the opposite extreme, if you, if you get all scared and you fall back and, and you, you pull away, then you're not able to, to assist anybody else and neither address the issue then. And everybody stays in their, in their, in their corners and, and then the problem gets bigger. Amen. And we need to be salt and light in our community right now. And, and I'll say, if, let's just forget the rest of the world for just a moment. In the nation of Canada, particularly here in, in the West, but this is definitely a, a national issue, is we, we, we've got an opportunity here. I'm going to address the political issue of the residential schools for a second. I don't care where you stand on it. Wrong is wrong. But more than that, if we go to the polar sides of this issue, we miss out on the opportunity to bring healing. And Jesus is the great healer. No amens for that. Say that again. Jesus is the great healer. He heals broken hearts. He heals broken minds. He he mends broken dreams. He puts people back together again. What a great opportunity. The devil's trying to tear apart the nation of Canada. Why is that? You ever think about that? Why is Canada going through the kind of turmoil it's going? It's not just because there's corruption. There's always been corruption. I really think that the enemy has his sights set on this nation because we have an opportunity to, be, to, to really impact the world in a way that a lot of other nations can't. Because all the nations are here. This Canada represents, has virtually represented from every nation on the planet. And we get along for the most part. Until the enemy gets in and starts stirring up people's ideologies, starts stir, stirring up media, starts stirring up authorities, uh, and government starts stirring up anger and fear. When the enemy gets in there, that's when things start going awry. Now, we see it played out in a human, but really, it's the enemy in the background. There's a spiritual war going on. And I, it seems like the enemy is really focused on our nation. And he's trying to divide us by, by race, by color, by language, by, by region. But what did Jesus do? He tore down walls. How do we know this? When Jesus died on the cross... When, 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 his, when he said, I give up my spirit to you, God, in the temple at the Holy of Holies, the curtain was torn open. And the block between God the Father, Yahweh, and the people was made way. He brought us together. The family was reunited like it was supposed to be in the garden. I think that the church has a great opportunity. And yes, Pentecostals may not have any, any, any role in, in what happened in the past, but we can have a role in the future. And we should move into there with healing, with understanding, with, with the, the ability to listen, the ability to restore. We should be the greatest bridge builders this nation has ever seen. But it'll never happen if we're not the salt and the light to this nation. So that's what today's message is all about. Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16. And we're going to read that in just a second, but here's the main thought for the day. A Christian's life should reflect Jesus and stand out as something better than what the world has to offer. We should stand out as something different. We should be odd. We should be strange to the world. I don't mean act weird. The world doesn't need more weird. But it does need people who are willing to stand out and be different. Diversity isn't a problem. What the problem is, is people with a lack of passion for the faith that Jesus has put in them. 
And so a Christian's life, your life, if you're a believer, if you say, yep, I'm, I'm a Jesus follower, I follow Jesus, then your life should be a reflection of Jesus. And Jesus was different than anything else. Even today, secular scholars look at Jesus and say he was a great man. But we know better, as those who have been redeemed through Jesus, that he wasn't a great man, he is a great God. And he didn't stay in the tomb. He didn't stay stuck there. He stepped out on his own power, on his own free will, and he destroyed death, hell, and the grave and brought freedom to anybody who would believe on him for the remainder of their life. But he gets into this Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitudes. And we'll, the Beatitudes are going to hit that long way down the road because lots of people know it. But right after that, we get to this, this point where he talks about salt and light. He gives two analogies or two examples, and he says, you're called to be salt and light, and he'll explain it, and I'll read it in a minute. But it makes us stand out as something better than what this world has to offer. Right now, think of it. Right now, the world has what to offer? Fear. Get your vaccine. Don't get your vaccine. The vaccine's bad. The vaccine's good. Uh, you're going to die of a variant. Not die of a variant. You're going to be mangled from this or mangled from that. Uh, there, the terrorists are here. The terrorists are there. There's violence there. There's violence here. There's drug overdoses there. There's suicide here. All these things the world's throwing at us. You're going to have to get a mark on your hand. You're not going to have to get a mark on your hand. You have to have a passport. You're not going to have a passport. What do you see with the world? You see all these extremes to cause you to be fearful, to cause you to be compliant, to cause you to not look to the one who has the answer for your life, who is Jesus. Christ. So we have the greatest opportunity, and if we don't seize it this year, we're going to miss out on it. And I believe God is looking to handpick churches. And when I say churches, I mean bodies of people in communities all around this nation. God is looking to handpick bodies that are willing and will be daring enough to stand out and be different from all the garbage that the world is throwing at us. To not give in to getting into all of our petty conspiracy theories or getting into all of our over-compliance or under-compliance or anywhere in between. To stop, to move away from those issues and to become the, the, what we're called to be, a light in a dark place. To be seasoning, to be the flavor of God where everything seems bland. We're called to stand out. So let's look, look at our text. Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the passage. You see two examples that Jesus is giving. This is right after the Beatitudes. And, and you see two things that Jesus is talking about. I'm going to jump to the last verse for a quick second so I can tie this together properly. Go back to verse 16. There it is. And let your light shine before others so that they may see your what? good deeds. This is where Christianity has the little phrase, you know, you get a little, a little, a little seam, and you get a little, and you pull on it, all of a sudden you got like a hole coming off. You ever had that happen on, one of your, on your clothes, where you have a little, a little uh, string on your sock, and you pull it, and all of a sudden like there's a big run up your sock, and it kind of ruins it? This is where Christianity comes with the phrase, and we like to pull on those little strings because they irritate us. Good deeds have undone more people on both extremes again than, than have helped or hurt. Like it just, It's crazy. So let me explain what I mean. We are called to do good deeds. Good deeds. I'm going to say that a couple of times to get it through your, through your mind. You are called to do good deeds. Every person in this place should be doing good deeds. The problem is, so many Christians, you can't tell their good deeds from their bad deeds. Why is it that less than 20% of, of church populations are involved in their church? Why is it less than probably 5% of, of Christians ever share their faith with anybody? We have to be people that are, act, are active in our faith. 
This is what brings, re- like, what makes faith real. This is what makes it all worthwhile. Getting involved, doing stuff, doing something for the Lord. You have given a, been given a purpose, and God's calling you out. And you see it right there. Good deeds to glorify your Father in heaven. See, if the good deeds don't glorify God, they're not good deeds. They're just actions. They might be good actions or positive actions or negative actions. But your actions are to glorify God in heaven. If your life isn't glorifying God in heaven, that's where you need to make the adjustment. Because the good deeds don't bring you salvation. The good deeds are, are, are saying as a testimony that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your life. So when you're home, if there are sinful things in your house that, you're, that you hold on to and nobody else knows it, God still sees it. You need to purge. You ever watch Hoarders on TV? You ever seen that? I go into like full panic mode when I see hoarders. I can't watch the show. I can't watch it. I can't watch it. When I, you just go, you watch. I've been in, and I've had to go and do, I did some renovations when I was younger and went into places where there was just junk everywhere. I feel like anxiety well up within me with all the clutter. Now, a little bit of clutter I can live with. You know, I have kids. I, I, I can manage. But when it's like stacked to the roof, I go into panic mode. Is anybody with me on that? Does anybody ever feel like that? You can't take that kind of clutter? Woo, man. It just go, it just, it's just something I can't handle. Some people's lives are like that. They hoard everything. So you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, you're my, you're my Lord and Savior. I, lo- I live for you. But then they hoard their anger. In their mind, they hoard their fear. In their life, they hoard their, their illegitimate relationships. They hoard their sexuality. They hoard their money. They hoard their stuff. They hoard their time. And if you were to look inside the the mind and soul of that individual, it would just be cluttered full of everything. You couldn't see Jesus in there if you tried. But, you you know, as you move some things, you'd find a little piece of Jesus here, and you move something there, you'd find a little bit of sin there. And that's basically how their life becomes. Well, we're called to to glorify God in heaven. So if good deeds don't glorify God in heaven, they're not good deeds. They're just actions. So let's go back, and we're going to go through this text, because I need to break this down, because you are called to be salt and light. We're called to bring flavor to the world. So I want to give you a couple of examples. We just had a heat wave a week and a half ago, right? 46 degrees, cooking cherries on the vine and, and things like that, damaging crops. It's an extreme event. The city put out a request saying, hey, would you be, you know, who would be willing to be a cooling center? Wouldn't it have been great if we had been organized enough that we could have been the cooling center? It's kind of nice and cool in here right now, isn't it? We just, we just put $30,000 into a new air conditioner. Wouldn't it have been great if we had a few people here with water, maybe some snacks, and just were able to sit around and, and talk with people as they cooled down from the community? You know, some of them are going to be unsavory. Some of them are going to come in and say, say the worst swear words in this place. I want you to know this isn't holy. This is a building. If it burns down tomorrow, it doesn't matter. We'll meet out in the ash pit, and we'll praise Jesus there. Uh, my, my faith is not bound to beams and lights and cameras. My faith is tied to my Savior in heaven. We have to start thinking like that. We have to rewire the brain. That's what seasoned people start to do. And you know what this seasoned person does? He gets angry sometimes, and he has to learn and catch that, and he has to give it back to Jesus, and he has to carve that out. It happens. So, think of it. If we had an opportunity, imagine we could have used our facility to do that. Come the fall, we're going to be doing a 12-step program in this building. We're going to start to use this building not just for nice Christian songs. We're going to do some sweaty work where people are going to come in hurt and they're going to leave healed. We're going to start to utilize this property. I want to see us down the road start to use our our parking lot to let those kids, that I, I, I go out and I meet with them, and they bike around, and they, they do skateboarding. I've got some ideas down the road. I'd like to be able to utilize the, the parking lot to get more kids here. That means we need people power. We need people that want to, to be grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles to these people. It means everybody needs to get all hands on deck because there's a storm a-coming. And if we're not ready, we're not going to be able to bring the light to the people that are coming, that Jesus is offering. And he's looking for churches in this very town, at this very moment, saying, hey, are you willing to step forward and do the dirty work for me? 
And I'll tell you this much, there is nothing more rewarding than to see somebody who absolutely hated you and hated God one day come to the realization that there's a, there's a power that created this universe that loves him so or her so much that they died on a cross for their life and that if they would just give it over to them, that anger would be gone in an instant. And if it takes 10 years to do it, it was the best 10 years of your life that you've ever spent. And so we go back to verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, you can't make it salty anymore. We run the risk as believers of getting to the point where we lose our saltiness. Not being salty. Let's not confuse the two. Have you ever been salty? Anybody in this place ever been salty? You know, too much salt is not good. But more often than not, and this is Jesus saying this, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. Church, and we, we see that if you go to Revelation, and it talks about the seven churches. Lukewarmness is the biggest danger that we have ever faced as a, as a believer. And you know something? Canada is lukewarm, apathetic, and, and is sitting on its hands. I would rather us be extreme one way or another so at least God then can turn the ship. But when you're, when you're stuck in the water with no engine, you're going nowhere. Friends, we, we have, to, uh, we have to, to make sure that we are salty enough to season the meat, to season the, 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 the meals that we're putting out there. What are the meals? The hope of Jesus. That you no longer have to be stuck in your sin. You're, you no longer have to identify with the evil that was in your heart. You can now identify with the healer and the Savior who wants to purchase you out of death, hell, and the grave. And so we see that. We can't lose our saltiness. You've got to be aware that you, you are, run the risk when you go to church every week and you don't, don't put out anything for the Lord in your life that you could become very lukewarm. And God says, I spew out lukewarm things. But I, I can work with cold or hot. So maybe, it's, maybe that's why the Lord is allowing the extremes in our country to take place. Because he can work with extremes. But you can't work with people who are in the middle. And the very plan that the enemy has to try to cause us to be extreme and go at each other's throats could be the very thing that God uses with a few people that would dare to believe in him and trust him and go in the way he's calling them to bring them together to unify. Man, I would love to see an awakening take place in this country that would unite every color, every language, every person in this nation. That we would no longer be all about pulling down statues and burning down buildings and hurting one another, but we'd be about talking and listening to one another and trying to work through the problems that we do have so that we could come together as brothers and sisters Amen. under God. And that brings us to verse 14. Then he says, after you season, you are the light of the world. This is the second example. You are the light of the world. So I'm going I'm to personalize it. You're the light of of Canada, you're the light of BC, you're the light of the Okanagan Valley, you're the light of Vernon, Coldstream, Lake Country, Armstrong, Lumbee, Enderby, and beyond. You're the light on the internet, you're the light in your neighborhood. You're the light at Alexis Park Church. You're the light in your school. You're the light in your workplace. You're the light in your restaurant that you go to. You're the light in your car. That's a hard one. You're the light of the world. You, that's what we are. We're called to be the light to the world. The world should be looking to us, not blowing us off. Why is it blowing us off? Because it can't see us. Last night at 2 a.m., I was sitting out on my front step watching the fire over here. I saw the thing start pretty much. It was just a little, it was like a little, like a little string. I was just looking out the window and I was like, what is that? And within two minutes, you start to see the puff of cloud. I'm like, uh-oh. And I called it in and all that stuff, like a good citizen. But you know, it, it's amazing how it, it, it catches your attention. The light is only a light when it's bright. When, it, when, it, when people can see it. We are the light. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You can't hide it. A light can't be hidden. Friends, we are called to be the light of the world. So neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand that it gives light to everyone in the house. This is why we put lights up here on the ceiling to bring us light here. This is why we put lights up here so you can see, so we can get, get them on camera. This is what we do with light. It's to help us see our way. 
It helped to look at what we need to look at. But you are the light. Jesus is the light. Who are we called to imitate? We're called to imitate Jesus. We're called to be a reflection of Jesus. We're called to stand out like Jesus stood out. There is no way back when Jesus was walking earth that people didn't come by him and go, there's something different about that guy. You see it throughout the Gospels. You see it throughout the writings. When Jesus came by, people went, there's something different. I got to stop. I got I to check this out. That's what people should be doing with us. We should be putting off the same kind of light. That people go, hey, you know what? I got to check them out. I, I don't want to, something's there. It's just something. I got to check them out. If people don't find hope in your life, your life is not completely wrapped up in Jesus. It's not completely wrapped up in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not completely wrapped up in the commands of the Lord. It's not completely wrapped up in, in the purpose and the hope of Christ. We don't put it under a bowl. Remember that old song? This little light of mine, let it shine. I'm not going to put it under a, a, a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Is your light shining? Are you bringing flavor? I think the reason why Jesus picked uh, salt and light for two very important reasons. You, we, we, work, we run with the senses, don't we? Like, I am very sensitive to smell. Like you go to a fragrance aisle in, in one of the stores at the mall there, whoo, man, I just like instant sneeze factory. I can pick up scents that are like, a, like a bloodhound. It's amazing. It does, I do not like it. But there's such a power there. You know when you smell cooked, like baking bread? For the, like you just come in from outside, you smell baking bread? It's just like something all of a sudden goes, okay, I just ate a full meal an hour ago. I'm ready to do it all over again. Where's that bread? You know? You smell like, and, and maybe, you know, maybe you're like me, you like some good, beautiful bacon and sizzling in the, in the thing, and you smell that in there, you're like, okay, I, one's not enough, I want the whole pan, you'll have to get your own pan. It just, it's like, you, you walk in and you smell fresh brewed coffee, and you're just like, gotta have that. It's just something, but there's a power in the smell. It's the same thing with light, like light, even, even if you have a hard time seeing, any bit of, if you can see at all, any bit of light Will, will help you. It will draw you. It'll, it'll draw your attention. And Jesus says that here. You know, you're called to bring flavor to the world. You're also called to show them the way. We're called to show the world the way. How do we do that? We forgive quickly. We, we have got to learn how to forgive quickly. We've got to be the people that don't walk in fear. And this last year has been marked in fear. And the coming year is going to get a whole lot better. The world wants to throw fear at us. We should be people of, of, of absolute courage. That doesn't mean we're not wise. If you're in the middle of a thunderstorm, you're going to have to take cover. You're not going to stand out in the lightning. You're going to get hit by it. I mean, even God's not going to fix stupid. Let's be honest. Sometimes we just act stupid. We're, we're called to, to, to not be like that. We're, we're called to do the opposite. So friends... We need to understand that God puts these, we're called to be light and flavor um, through, this, through salt. And you know, too much of anything hurts as well, doesn't it? If you stare at one of these lights, if I look at this light right now, I will not see you for the next half hour. I will be completely blind because there'll be one big square light right in here. Same thing is if you take a whole thing of salt and you down that, you're going to dry out real fast, aren't you? And, and that's the thing. We're not called to, to, over, like, to overdo it with people. We're called to shine and to bring flavor. Sprinkle it on. A little goes a long way. That means, God, what, what is it, what's the other analogy that God's trying to put across there? You don't need a lot to do a lot. You may think, oh, well, then if I'm not the, if I'm not the speaker, then I'm not, you know, I don't really have an effect. No, no. You just getting involved with somebody in their life and, and, and encouraging them and praying for them and talking with them and just being an example to them. Not telling them how to do everything. Just live it out before them. Be, be the, what Jesus was for you. The kindness and the love and, and, and the power of God through your life. That, that will have more of an effect. You know, if every person in here worked on one person, we would double this place overnight. If, if, if every church thought of that in this town, there would, we, would, we would convert this city to the hope of Christ in a month. You just got to think of it that way. It's not about you doing everything. It's about you doing your one thing. And here's the main thought 
another main thought, you cannot lead others where you're not willing to go yourself. You cannot, I, I, you'll hear me say this a lot, I do say this a lot, you can't lead others where you're not willing to go yourself. I don't lead from the top down, I try to lead from the front out. If we're going into war, I'll be in front. I'll take the arrows, I don't care. Because Jesus did it already for me. The least we could do is run out front. Besides, if you're going to go into war, my God goes before me. Who can stand against me? If you go out into war for the Lord, and war isn't about fighting people, it's about fighting the dark forces uh, of the enemy, of the devil, and his angels, and of, of our sinful flesh. There's, there's as much devil in our DNA as there is in spiritual forces of the devil. Remember, the devil's one person. He's one being. A lot of times, uh, it's not the devil affecting your life, it's you. That may not be something you want to hear, but you can take that for what it's worth. So how do you stand out and influence others? Love people like God does. Love people like God does. Jesus is amazing. He shows what real love is. It's not emotional, gooey love. It's love that somebody's willing to die. Die to themselves and die even in their life if they have to. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have eternal life. That's what the love of God is all about. If you could sum up everything I'm talking about this morning, being salt and light, it's the love of God. How do you stand out? How do you make a difference? How do you influence others? Start loving people like God does. You don't have to go die on a cross. Just die to yourself. And that's the hardest death of all, isn't it? It is hard to die to yourself. You want to hold on to those things. You want to be tough. You want to be this or you want to be that. Some of you, you're not too tough. You're too weak. Some of you are not too weak. You're too strong. And then there's everything else in between. Like we're all a spectrum here. But, but you've got to love people the way God does. That, that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. We're called to help people not perish. Jack Heil says, Love is the doorway through which the human soul passes from selfishness to service. Get involved. Get involved in these small groups when they, as they start up. Say, you know what? I don't know how to do one. I will personally be the coach for every small group in this church. You, you're gonna get, if, you, if I annoy you, well, you'll get to be annoyed more. But the fact is, is that we, we, need, to, we need to raise up people to, to have a group of people that they can be accountable to and for. And so, um, love is that doorway. Love is about serving. You, when you walked in today, there was people on the doorway to open the door for you. There was somebody there to check you in. There, there's people to hold these doors open. There's people to, to sing for you. There's people to run the sound and the lights so that we can do these things. They're, they're, that's a little act of love for Jesus. The Word of God says that if you, do even, if you give even a cup of cold water in my name, you've done it for me. If you, if you do something for the least of these, you've done it for me. Don't think that when you do hold the door that you're doing it, you know, it's just, you're just holding a door. You're doing it for Jesus. The people are getting the benefit, but you're, you're doing it for Jesus. Second thing you can do to stand out, lead by example. Lead by example. If you think and act like everyone else, it becomes really hard to make a difference. We're not called to act like the world. We're called to act like Jesus. Maybe you haven't clued this in from, from the, the beginning of this message today. We're called to act like Jesus. Jesus is the one we're, we're called to be like. Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. He is our Savior. He is the one we're called to, ex be the example, to live the example of. That's who we're called to be like. Jesus is the one that sets us free. Jesus is the one that sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that's coming back for his church. Jesus is the one that's going to defeat he death, hell, and the grave. Jesus is going to defeat Satan and his angels. Jesus is going to reign on the throne for a thousand years. Jesus is going to reign for eternity in heaven. I think we need to get to know this person called Jesus. Just put it out there. But if we think like the world that Jesus doesn't have the power, we'll have no power. We'll, we'll stay stuck. We'll stay afraid. We'll stay discouraged. We'll stay defeated and we'll stay despondent. And Vernon will look the same next year as it does today. Canada will look maybe even worse than it does today. Friends, we have such a great mandate. It's not about everybody one, one, you know, going out into a giant physical war and blowing things up. It's about blowing up spiritual realms 
that are against the Lord. And you do that one relationship at a time. Lead by example. It, 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 you want to make a difference? Pick one person God's put in your life and love on them like Jesus. And you'll be amazed at the influence, the impact, and the change that will start to take place in their life. Remember, it's not, it's not up to you to get them saved. It's just up to you to show them the door. They've got to walk through it. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't look down on anyone because you are young. This is Paul saying this to Timothy when you're talking about leading by example. He says, But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If I had time, we would just do a message on purity. But we're called to be an example in how we talk, in how we operate, in how we love, in the faith that we have in God, and in the purity in which we do all those things. That's, that's what being an example is. You, you do what other people are not willing to do. And we do it because Jesus led the way on that. And then the last thing today is this. Become a motivator. I, I can't say this enough. This, I, I should take time to do this, but I, we don't have a lot of time. But Become a motivator. I know, I, I, see, I, I see comments online, people blame a lot of pastors about, oh, they're just motivational speakers. Duh. Anybody, if you criticize a speaker because they're motivational from the pulpit, you're the problem. My goodness. We know the Savior. We have the Word of God. If there isn't motivation from Genesis to Revelation, there's nothing that's going to give you any motivation. We need more people in, in, in pulpits and in small groups and in, and in ministries that are motivating people around to love and good works. The Bible says spur them on. We talked about this last week. Spur one another on to love and good works. Spurring is a jarring. It's a, it's a whoa, wake them up. We're called to motivate, guys. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. There's the good works again. That's our job. Your job is to motivate. Motivate your, your spouse, motivate your kids, motivate your friends, motivate your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, and everybody else. Motivate them to love and good works. Because good works moves you away from bad works. This is very complicated. I haven't been known to be you know, the most you know, theologically uh, deep I think this is pretty simple. When you're not doing bad works, you're doing good works. Maybe if we were about our Father's business, as the, the Bible says, we wouldn't be about the world's business. We're called to spur and motivate one another on to love and work. Can I, if I could do anything as I wrap this up, I want to motivate you today. I want to motivate everyone, the youngest person to the oldest person in this place. Just because you have a bad hip and can't get around doesn't mean you can't bring the love of Jesus to somebody in your life. Maybe it's your care aid worker. If you're, if you're immobile. Maybe it's just the worker that comes to your house or helps you. And they can see that you care for them. That you love them. That you talk good of them. That you don't complain when they try to work with you. That you talk about things of hope that God has done in your life. And if you're young and you're, you're, you're got, God, it's got you doing things, whoever it is that you're working with, that you tell them about the good things that God is doing. I don't mean slapping Bibles. The old days, I think the old days of, of, of being in everybody's face is done. Thank God. You know what, who changed my life? A simple man who just told me a little bit about how God changed his life. He didn't try to convert me that day. He didn't try to, to you know, lay, slap his hands on me. He didn't try to tell me I was terrible. All he did was tell me about how good God was in his life. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We need to be a people of testimony again. And we need to go out into our community when we leave church. And we need to be like that church when we're scattered as much as when we're gathered. If the songs that we sang this morning aren't in your heart when you leave, Put them back in your heart. Put them on repeat. To, take, to put away your secular music for a while and put on some music that glorifies the Lord. If your readings of, of, of the books that you're reading aren't, aren't bringing you around to thinking about the Lord, put them aside for a little while and pick up the Word of God and allow that to, to permeate your heart. Get involved in church. I'm putting the challenge out. You need to be in small groups this fall. We, we all need to be in them. We need to do Alpha. We, we need to do Glow Party. We, we need to do baptisms. We, we need to do witnessing. We need to do self-help groups. 
or 12-step programmers. We need to do these things. We need to give the tools to those who are in need because we are the salt and the light of the world. We are called to stand out. And it's never going to happen if we don't get up and start doing it. Because you cannot lead others where you're not willing to go yourself. We need to be givers with our money, of course. But we also need to be givers of our time. I'm going to go one step deeper. We need to be givers of our heart. To, the, to those who aren't so lovable. Because that's what Jesus did for us. That's what Jesus did for you. For each one of you. For the people on this stage, Jesus did that for them. They were unlovable at one time. Now I know you look at Michael, how could he be unlovable? It's not possible. But the truth is this, we weren't lovable at one time, but God loved us. Anyways, we're called to stand out. So if I can motivate you to do one thing is this week, as soon as you leave this building, if you're not staying to continue uh, serving after, for the next service, would you please, would you please stand out and season your conversations, season your heart and your mind. Start looking at the world the way Jesus does. He's broken for this world. When those kids walk to the gates in Ukraine, Jesus is looking at them. When you walk through the doors of this place, Jesus is looking at you. When you're downtown and you see some undesirable people, Jesus is looking at them. When you're in your place of work and that business guy or gal walks through and they look all tough but they're, they're broken on the inside, Jesus is looking at them. When you see prideful people, Jesus is looking at them. How do we change that? We start to season the things we say, the way we think and how we pray and we put the light on full, and we let it shine as brightly as we can all around us that it might grab someone's attention for the goodness of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we wanna be people that stand out, and we have to motivate each other and spur each other on to love and good works, and that's hard, but Lord, you are so worth it. And so today, God, I pray for every person in this place that we would put down our distractions and we'd pick up the mission and the mission is to go and make disciples in Vernon and beyond I pray God that in the coming days you are going to spur new new uh, ministries new visions new acts of mercy God that will impact this city like we have never thought possible it hasn't even birthed yet God I pray that you would start to anoint your people in new and fresh ways in this in this house that God, when they leave here, they, yeah, they may not be a pastor, but Lord God, they're going to pastor people in their life. Lord God, I pray that those who are going to be around, those that are broken, they're going to have answers that are going to come right from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that is going to help break the bondages that those people around them have been in for so long. And Lord God, the miraculous is going to take place once again in this community because a few people would dare to stand out and bring flavor and light to dark places. And I speak to the devil right now by the power of Jesus' name. Your time is done. And we're coming for you, not on our own strength, but on the strength of our Savior. He destroyed you at the cross. He walked out of the grave. And devil, you are a liar and you're defeated. Whatever you say has no power over, your, over God's people. And so Lord, today I pray that we would rise up in faith in hope and in love to touch and minister to this community and beyond, Lord God, that would have repercussions and waves, Lord God, that would sweep to the ends of this province and the ends of this country and across the world. It's got to start here and it's going to start now. We commit our day to you. We commit our lives to you that we're going to stand out anew. We're going to be the salt. We're going to be the light. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand as we close in the song?